Water Street, Elmira, New York. We're in the office of the Historian General, Archie Kiefer, and we are interviewing Archie today for the Veterans History Project. For the recording, Archie, could you please state your full name and your date of birth? Uh, Jane Arthur Kiefer. I was born on March 27th, 1921. Thank you. And could you please also state um, the branch of service and the war that you served? All right. I was in branch service. I was in the Signal Corps, attached to the Signal Corps, uh, for my first two years that I was in the service. Uh, secure, and I was in security. Uh, when the security of the United States was established, uh, I was then transferred to the full air. And uh, I volunteered for... Uh, Aerial Gunnery School, and uh, then I went into training to be a aerial gunner in a B-24 bomber. Can you tell me how you first went into the military, how you first got involved? What what made you do this? I mean, well, that was uh, a lot of my friends using about uh, 60 to 80 planes a day or a and uh, many of my friends were in, involved in that, and uh, it was natural to to uh, because, uh, to fly. You had this is a strictly a uh, program, and uh, it was a whole thing. I felt that I had uh, enough, in the and I wanted to get in the of the uh, uh, war. Okay. Back to when you first enlisted, did you enlist or were you drafted? No, no. no. I was drafted in okay. October of uh, 1942. I had a deployment. Uh, prior to that, simply because bricklayers were not, they were scared. Mm -hmm. And I was working on a naval job in Mara. Uh, it, which later became a uh, tool. Uh, but I was working on it, and I got a permit from the Army by the Navy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and then, uh, then I was directed and I did the service and went through my basic training. My first training was that as a uh, 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 teletype operator and... Uh, I went through the training, and thank God I did, because now I can use the operator. Okay. But uh, the work became the and uh, so I was transferred into security, uh, the eastern seaboard. Mm -hmm. And I was there on it. school and became a uh, uh, dog trainer because uh, I had a lot of experience with dogs in uh, my private life. And uh, I went to school, came back, I did good school. Reading, uh, I became a corporal and became a sergeant and uh, was in charge of uh, 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 places where we had in the coast mm -hmm. all the way from uh, to uh, up into uh, Massachusetts. Okay. And if, uh, tell me about basic training when you got drafted. Go back to the very beginning. What, okay. what do you remember? Well, we had, I remember we had a big division by the name and uh, I went to uh, I was to Westfield, Massachusetts for my basic training. It was a. It was something that I enjoyed. Uh, Sergeant Wheeler, a, a very hard tech, uh, in, uh, the soldiers, mm -hmm. and uh, we became fairly accurate at marching and drilling. And he taught well in that. Uh, and I had that in. So it it was. 
easy. Mm -hmm. But I was a young man. Uh, uh, I came home. I had a furlough. My first Christmas. And we uh, hitchhiked from uh, Field, Massachusetts to... Um, Got a ride right in Albany, and all uh, the friend of mine, his family, and they gave us a ride home to Elmar. It was home to Elmar eight hours, and I slept four of them. <laughs> Who with? You said we. Who were? Yeah, uh, a you? fellow by the name of Al Geishan. They uh, Al Geishan owned uh, a supermarket, one of the first in Elmar on Langdon. I don't remember the name of the the supermarket, but it was uh, it was a very good one, and they uh, they were there until the family uh, the other supermarkets came in. Mm -hmm. And you went to basic training with them at the yes, same time. Yes, yes, he and I were in the same barracks. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice gentleman, and uh, I was in the same barracks. There were uh, several L uh, men. Uh, one was Charlie Granger whose father was a, in the construction business the same as I was prior to uh, going into the service. And uh, Charlie and I were in the same uh, uh, class, mm -hmm. and uh, and I were good friends also. Nice. Was it unusual, do you think, for people to serve with so many people from their same home? From the no, hometown? not, uh, not uh, unnecessary. I went through basic training. There was another guy, and he, he later and I, we're in politics uh, uh, as Louis Augustine and Louis uh, and I went to high school together. No, because they uh, they would draft people. Uh, they would get to a certain age bracket and uh, they would send the notices out and we were all the same age so we all, many of us went to school together uh, and uh, that was not unusual. Okay. No, no, it was not unusual. Okay. Yeah. Now, what specifically do you remember about was it Sergeant Wheeler? What do you what what sort of things do you remember about him? He had a large voice. Uh -huh. He could drill a whole company at once. Okay. Uh, very unusual, and that was his specialty. And there's an interesting anecdote about that. Sergeant Wheeler was uh, our sergeant at uh, at Westover Field, Massachusetts, and like I said, he had a large voice. After, at the end of my career, I came back from overseas and was uh, assigned uh, to Greensboro, North Carolina as an instructor uh, to teach the officers how to shoot skeet. All gunners had to learn to shoot skeet. And um, who was training rookies? When I heard this guy's voice, you'd never forget it, and there was Sergeant uh, Wheeler still training rookies in Greensboro, North Carolina. He never got overseas. Uh, we split a beer. We had a good time. We had a nice visit in the remnant. And he remembered my class from up in uh, Massachusetts three years earlier. Mm -hmm. And I, I always remembered Sergeant Wheeler, you know, <laughs> with pleasant memories. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> what else do you remember about being in Massachusetts? Well, they had a good USO there. Beautiful USO there. Tell me about that. Uh, the USO was in a uh, a public building. Uh, they had uh, it was a, a large building with a large dance floor. They you could go there. They had a large library. Uh, it was uh, and in Massachusetts in the winter time was pretty cold and we had a lot of snow, but uh, it was a place you could go. Uh, where uh, they had a lot of USO girls come there. <clears throat> uh, they had dances. Uh, they had cards, pool tables. They had all those type of things, writing rooms, reading rooms, especially writing rooms. Uh, when you're in the service and you're away from home, you, you acquire a lot of addresses and you your buddies that you grew up with and they're all over the world and you drop them a line and uh, printing was free for a service. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't have to pay for any stamps. Uh, it was unusual to go to town and uh, 
they had, uh, if you went there and wanted to go to a movie, you could go to the U.S. and they had free tickets to go to a movie. Or as a show, you could go to a show or something of that nature. This was in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Uh, it was it was a it was a very very good place that uh, uh, the local community provided for uh, the army uh, in the area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how much free time did you have on your hands? Well, uh, I was going to basic training, and uh, there was day rooms right on the base that were darn good too. Uh, and we would have dance into there, so sometimes you didn't have to go into town. I love to dance, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, if if you were a soldier and you loved to dance, there were a lot of USO girls that liked to dance too. In fact, later that's where I met my wife at a USO dance. Uh, they were very strict with their girls, uh, and that was a good thing. Uh, they uh, the girls could not. Uh, Go off the base. They could not go out of the buildings. They could. They were very strict, and they had, uh, they had uh, chaperones. They were very heavily chaperoned, and uh, so. Um, and I'll tell you the story about my wife after a while. How I got to know her. Okay. Because, uh, and I'll throw it in right now. Uh, later on, I went to a U.S. O, o dance, and there was this girl that I asked, to dance, and uh, she was a very pretty girl, and. Uh, we uh, we danced and uh, uh, I said to her I'd like to get to know you better and she said well I'm going to mass tomorrow morning and uh, uh, if you want uh, I'll be there with my sisters and so I met her at church the next morning uh, for mass and uh, she introduced me to two older sisters and uh, they invited me to come home with her and so I went home and met her parents and it was a nice formal thing and uh, we got to know each other and we started uh, keeping each other's company and I was stationed too long for one t one time and it, it, I was stationed there for over a year and so we got to be quite uh, uh, well we fell in love you know just like two kids are supposed to do <laughs> Yeah. What year was that? Oh, that was uh, that was in 19. I met my wife in 1943, mm -hmm. and I knew her for over a whole year before we got engaged. Mm -hmm. And then we were engaged for all um, oh, about four months. And then uh, uh, I asked her if she uh, wanted to uh, wait till after the war or uh, uh, to get married or. Did she want to get married at that time? And she said she'd just as soon get married. So I got a uh, four-day pass. I got it at Christmas time. And it's funny that you're uh, interviewing me today because in five more days, I'm going to be married 60 years to the same girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a four-day pass and uh, went to uh, Long Island. I was at that time, I was in the flying end of... Uh, of uh, uh, the Air Corps, and uh, I, uh, we got married, and uh, we had a honeymoon in New York City. We had a formal uh, wedding with attendants, and my wife was dressed in a wedding gown, a lovely wedding gown, and uh, of course I was in uniform, but uh, my mother and father came down to uh, Long Island, and uh, we had a beautiful, uh, beautiful wedding, and we had a honeymoon in New York City. Uh, we went again to that same USO in Holyoke, Massachusetts, and they found us a beautiful room to stay in. And Sophie and I was uh, in Massachusetts for another five weeks, and then I shipped overseas. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it was that was practically a honeymoon to be able to leave an army base and go home and be with your wife, where she make you a good meal. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very nice apartment that we had. I even remember the names, the people's name was Schmidt, and uh, they were German uh, people. And, uh, they were lovely, lovely people, lovely home, nice neighborhood. They had just uh, uh, made a couple of room uh, apartment, and it was a very nice apartment, warm, friendly, mm -hmm. good neighborhood, 
and I liked Holyoke, Massachusetts. It was a good town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you um, quickly give us uh, Sophie's whole name? What was her maiden oh, name? Sophie's uh, maiden name was Dyachen, D-I-A-C-H-U-N, Dyachen, and uh, uh, which. Like all Europeans, they changed their names when they came to uh, to America. Uh, it's not unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, many times the immigration people would change the names. Uh, but uh, no, that wasn't unusual, mm -hmm. and that's, that's her real name. So, so whole first name? Yeah, so Sophie. Sophie yeah. Dyson Kiefer. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great story. <laughs> yeah, we have Sophie and I danced. A lot. We learned she turned me, taught me how to polka mm -hmm. and do the abreta, uh, and I taught her how to uh, uh, jitterbug and how to, uh, I had formal dancing lessons when I was a, a young man here in Elm. And, uh, uh, so I knew how to dance, uh, formal dances. I knew how to do what we call in the, those days, the Peabody, which was a fast form of dancing. I knew formal waltzes, I knew how to tango, rumba, do all of those type, and I taught Sophie how to do that, but she taught me how to polka. And uh, we had a lot of fun dancing all of our life. We danced up until about 10 years ago when our legs went on the fritz. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we still could dance, but that's part of life. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Now if we could go back to basic training again, what were you being trained to do? Well, we were trained, we, we were being trained, Soldiers have to take basic training. All soldiers have to take basic training. They have to learn uh, military procedures and they have to learn how to drill, uh, how to march, and those kind of things. And they have to learn how to uh, use weapons and stuff like that. All of that comes in basic training. But I was also going to school uh, to, uh, for uh, office work and stuff like that. And uh, uh, they. And then when the basic training was finished, uh, we were shipped to uh, Mitchell Field, Long Island, and I went to uh, uh, office training, mm -hmm. uh, cryptographic work, which is the dealing with uh, uh, codes and so forth like this, secret codes and stuff like this, uh, teletyping, mm -hmm. typing, uh, and that was the basic training of what, what I was learning. Okay. But, uh, it was funny that they would have us training uh, doing that uh, and then because the wax had become a part of the United States Army and then they turned all of this work over to the wax. Mm -hmm. which, how, how, long do you, how long were you doing this work, the office work? I did it. I only, uh, uh, I was assigned after I finished that advanced training, I was assigned to an outfit uh, that's headquarters was in New York City. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, radar outfits around the perimeter of New York. And uh, uh, I was assigned at headquarters, and uh, I was only there for a month. And the wax came in, and then I was shipped out to one of the, uh, one of the balloons, shipped out to, uh, uh, out on Long Island. Mm -hmm. A place called uh, Rock Hill, and a Rock Hill is a golf course, and it's called... Uh, Rock Hill Golf Course is what it's called, uh -huh. and they build a golf course all around this this place uh, today. But it was a radar station, and I went to, again to school. I learned how to read uh, radar scopes, which were very important. Uh, and uh, you, uh, well, it was it was something you had to pull security, and I was good at security. Uh, I was good at. Uh, uh, Sergeant Wheeler had picked me out in basic training and taught me how to drill men. Mm -hmm. So in these small platoons, they, you had to have everything. Uh, you had to all ha be able to do all kinds of weapons, which that came second nature to me. I became a very good uh, 45 automatic uh, uh, machine gunner. I became a BAR man. I, I was a good rifle uh, soldier. Uh, I used a uh, a uh, 50 caliber water-cooled uh, machine gun and trained other men how to do it. And first thing you know, I, I got away from the radar scopes and was a trainer like Sergeant Wheeler was. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they gave me a couple of stripes 
because of doing that kind of work. And then they, they, the dog uh, uh, program of the United States came into being, and uh, they selected me and chose me, and I went to Front Royal, Virginia. Okay. How long were you doing radars? Only about a month. About a month, and uh, then, then you went on to Virginia. Yeah. Tell me about the dog program. Tell me the basics of that. What, oh, well, what? That, was a, that was a great program. Uh, there were more than one kind of a dog. There was a sentry dog. Now, that's what I trained. But there was a, a, a messenger-type dog. Now, they would generally, uh, those kind of dogs were generally German shepherds. Uh, sentry dogs would be any kind, and uh, the great ones were Doberman Pinsert's. Uh, they were a good dog, but uh, the Belgian shepherds, the German shepherds, that didn't make it into the messenger dogs. And then there were attack dogs. The, the attack dogs, uh, they kept mainly for an infantry guys. The uh, sentry dogs were uh, uh, dogs that were trained to be, uh, to give you uh, a soldier an alert a long distance away if somebody was trying to come up onto them because they would be out on a lone sentry uh, post guarding uh, and uh, he would have a dog along with him. It gave him a lot of security and the dog became his buddy. Mm -hmm. uh, these were dogs that were all donated by people in the United States and they were sent there to, to Front Royal Virginia to be trained. The dog trainers that we had were the highly most professional dog trainers in the world. Some of them even had trained dogs for the German army. And I remember there was one officer that he would say, uh, uh, when, you would, when your dog would do something, he'd say, now, praise your dog, yeah. And he would speak in, in German to you, you know what I mean? Uh, but he was an American uh, and he had learned his business in Germany. and. Uh, they had, uh, uh, it, it was a good place and it was uh, uh, hard training and uh, sometimes these dogs would become uh, too vicious to handle. The uh, sentry dogs as well? Yeah, the sentry dogs. The sentry dogs would become, uh, because they were taught to be mean uh, and there were trainers, special trainers that would uh, do them and it was not a gentle way of training a dog. They wanted them to be a very alert. Mm -hmm. They wanted them to so that uh, that if somebody come 200 yards away, that dog would be looking for them. You know what I mean? And they wanted them to be so that they were aggressive. Mm -hmm. However, they were also trained to be uh, to be uh, uh, to get along with uh, people with uh, uh, United States uniforms on, and the men then could handle them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they would get just a dog. After all, is uh, his heritage is the wolves, and uh, the trainers that we had uh, would dry uh, would dress in civilian clothes, and they would uh, they would hide from the dogs. And then when the dogs would uh, you would walk by with your dog, he they would jump out, yell, scream, hit them with a, a switch. They would train them to be. That was how they would train to so that they would be an alert dog. It could be a Doberman. It could be. I had, uh, I had one, uh, 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 the coach dog, uh, and then I had another one. I had a, a boxer. Uh, in fact, he was a very good breed. He came from uh, his. Uh, his father was uh, a show dog. His father. He was. He was Lustig the third, and his father was Lustig the first, and uh, they were. They were wonderful animals. I had. Uh, uh, German Shepherd, his name was Bingo, outstanding uh, animal. Uh, I even had a Gordon Setter. I got him in Long Island and he was such a good dog, I detrained him and tr again trained him for birds and I'd go out and put a shotgun with him. Oh, he was a wonderful, wonderful. A Gordon Setter is a special kind of a dog. Mm -hmm. Wonderful dog. How long did you have him? Oh, I had them uh, until they did away with the security, and then I had to ship all my dogs back mm -hmm. because they offered them back to the people. Okay. They offered them back to the Can people. You tell me about your typical day when you're working with the dogs. Just uh, pick a, a typical day and, and start at dawn and, and tell well, me Well, you see, it. I didn't walk guard duty okay. with the dogs. What I did is have to keep them sharp, and I had to make sure that they were groomed properly, and I had to clean them. I had to clean up.
prism. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Army was very <laughs> specific on that, that. You had to groom and groom that dog every single day. You had to take him up for exercise. He wasn't working that night. And a dog would generally take a four-hour uh, uh, trip. Uh, what we And I had five dogs in every platoon. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I would do this in the morning. Then I had a Jeep go to another platoon and check the handlers that were there. And I would, uh, then I would also uh, train the people that were on guard duty. I would tra train them in weaponry and I'd train them how to handle a dog mm -hmm. and what to do with the dog. Be friendly with the dog, pet the dog, uh, those kind of things so that the dog would be comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they could, uh, you know, they could turn on their handlers, and uh, and we had dogs that did that. But uh, the, you had to train them. You had to train the handlers how to handle a dog that would turn uh, sour on you too, because uh, uh, no dog with a choke chain can handle a man. And there's a definite procedure how to handle a vicious animal. Mm -hmm. uh, it, yeah, I don't say that they weren't. They were wonderful dogs, but you're going to have bad, uh, a few bad ones like that, and uh, it was it was unfortunate, but that was how they were trained. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once you finished training them, what would have happened to the dogs next? Where would they have been sent? Well, uh, I trained them, and they were they were assigned to the platoons, and. Um, in fact, one of my platoons and one of our dogs and one of the things, I didn't do this, but he, uh, he captured some Germans on Long Island where they let them off uh, uh, on a submarine. Okay. And it was one of my dogs that, uh, and uh, some of the people underneath me uh, that, that captured those Germans, uh, those uh, dogs. He was walking the beach and it was near a radar station and uh, the Germans uh, got out and they came up on the on the, the uh, beach there, and uh, uh, they were caught. And uh, uh, by this uh, 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 war dog, and uh, we called them war dogs, and, uh, but uh, that was very good. That they do, you, do you remember the dog's name? No, no. I remember a few in the war platoon that I was there all the time, uh -huh. but uh, uh, they would have names like Bozo, uh -huh. uh, uh, I had, uh, like I said, there was Bingo and there was um, Lustig. Uh, well, I'm searching my memory now. Okay. <laughs> don't, come, don't come too quick anymore. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did you hear about the incident with the submarine? Did that news get back to you? Oh yes, yes, quickly? it made headlines. Uh huh. Oh, it made headlines in uh, in uh, New York area uh, because it was only. Well, it was about uh, uh, 75 miles out from, uh, it was near West Hampton Beach, uh, Long Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't keep things like that a secret. And, that, and, and uh, uh, the officers and that were very proud that, uh, you know, that these things, uh, uh, I, I had officers over me, but I, was, I had the highest uh, rank in the, in the, uh, as a dog trainer. Mm -hmm in that whole company, see, mm -hmm. that was, it was, it was, it was good, it was good. Now, how long did you work with the dogs? Until security was established here in the United States. Now, approximately how long did that take? Oh, I'm going to say that it was, uh, I'm going to say it was 19, the end of 1943. Uh, I was with the I was with the program maybe a year and a half, uh, and then uh, then I shipped out from there. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky. I knew the uh, I knew the uh, personnel officer, and uh, he and I had worked together over there, dogs and personnel and stuff like that. And when I was interviewed to be transferred out of that outfit, they took half of them, put them in the infantry. And the other half they put in the Air Corps, and I asked to go into the Air Corps, thinking about possibly getting into f the flying end. And uh, they shipped me from uh, New York City to uh, Chatham Field, Georgia. And uh, But once again, I got to Chatham Field, Georgia, and because of the stripes on my arm and, and the experience in security, 
put in, of, uh, I was a sergeant of the guard, uh, interior guard, and uh, it was thing that uh, I didn't really like that kind of duty. It was uh, it was guarding uh, American prisoners, Americans, soldiers who had goofed up, and uh, German uh, prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. The German prisoners of war were a lot easier to take care of than the Americans were. Why do you say that? Because they were better trained. Uh, the American prisoners were goof-offs. They were the ones that uh, uh, made up of what we in the Army would call the well-known 2%, were the people that uh, uh, wouldn't accept uh, Army life, would go over the hill, would do everything that they could to violate rules and regulations. Uh, and uh, uh, they were not they were not real good uh, good people and you treated them just like a guard would treat prisoners in a prison mm -hmm. and you had to because there was an army regulation if you were guarding prisoners and one escaped they didn't catch him you served his time so you were not very gentle with these people. I had an officer who goofed up, stole money, and being that I was a sergeant, I had to personally take care of him. And he told me one time, he said, I was a track man, and uh, if I started to run, you cannot catch me. And I said, sir, I had a forty-five Thompson machine gun. I said, I'll cut your legs right out from underneath you. And I would have because I would have had to serve his time. And he went. He was, he, was, uh, he was found guilty and they put him in Leavenworth. You know, some of these guys, even though he was an officer, some of these guys were crooks. Some of them were not good people. And the Army had their share of them. And uh, that was not a happy duty. Mm -hmm. And I was glad. I was only there for a month. I was glad. I was glad I got out of that. That's where I volunteered because I, I could see these airplanes and I seen these guys training and I wanted to get into that. And I, when I volunteered, the ink wasn't hardly even wet on the volunteer thing and they shipped me out. Mm -hmm. That's how bad they needed gunners. What kind of special training did you have to do when you volunteered? Well, you, you went away to, uh, ten, I went to Tendo Field, Florida. It was a lovely place. Right along the beach, Panama City, Florida. And um, it, was, it was gorgeous. Now the training there was in learning how to shoot. How, uh, I, although I knew how to shoot, I knew how to shoot machine guns. It's an entirely different ball game. You, uh, you uh, learned how to shoot skeet. You became an expert at shooting skeet. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that? Describe skeet. Skeet uh, shooting skeet. There's trap shooting trap and shooting skeet. Trap goes straight away, but it'll break to the right or break to the left, break up or break down. That's the only thing it can do. Shooting skeet, the the skeet shoots them across you at a different degree. Now that kind of training would train you, and these were what they call a bird. It would be a clay pigeon, a bird, and you learn to shoot them with an open, rigorous shotgun. And the, and the people that we had training us were world champions. And we became very good at these because uh, the advanced training into that, they would uh, put you into a turret, the same as a turret that you were going to fly a machine gun and fire a machine gun. They would put you in a turret and they would have uh, uh, shotguns, two shotguns on, on that turret. And then they would f uh, send these uh, 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 clay pigeons uh, they had a, a stance, and they would send them right at you, flying the simulating of a pursuit curve. And they would, uh, 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 you would have to be able to shoot them. And believe me, you couldn't miss. You had to shoot them. I mean, if you couldn't shoot a shotgun and you couldn't learn how to shoot these, you were washed out. And uh, nobody wanted to get washed out of something like this. Because this is part of the elite part of, uh, of the Air Corps. And then another, the one that you had to pass was they would, uh, you would write on the back end of a, um, of a open truck where you could brace your feet with a shotgun uh, 
you had to, and the the truck go around uh, uh, like figure eight stuff like this in the, in a, and they uh, uh, 30 miles an hour and all of a sudden this skeet would start coming out from different angles and stuff like that and you had to shoot them and you had to get 20 out of 25 if you didn't get 20 out of 25 you could wash out mm -hmm. uh, fortunately I I didn't wash out I I learned to shoot skeet Tell and me about I'm, the first time you shot a skeet. Do you remember the first time? The first time, well, it was it was here. I had never shot skeet okay. before. It was the first time that I have ever shot skeet, and I was taught by the army. Mm -hmm. And there's an interesting story about that. After the war was over, I came back, and they had uh, uh, places that you could go and shoot skeet, and they would shoot it, and they would have what they would call jackpots. It cost you five bucks to get in to shoot, and. Uh, I went there and I won a few five dollar bills from a lot of other guys and pretty soon they wouldn't shoot against me <laughs> because I was an expert skeet shooter and uh, uh, trap was like shooting a Rhode Island hen uh, taken off, you know what I'm getting at, but uh, trap was very easy because all you had to do was just lead it a little bit. Everything has to be led, so you couldn't shoot right at the, the target. Everything had to be led. Uh, in other words, the, if the if it was coming in, 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 the simulation is that when a jet or when a fighter plane would come in on a uh, a bomber, he would be over here and a bomber would be going straight in line like this in, and he would take a, what we would call a pursuit curve, and he would he would gun his plane and then he would come in and he would shoot ahead of the, pl uh, the our bombers, and he then you would run into the bullets. Do you see what I mean? So you to simulate the same way when you were shooting at him you would have to simulate the same thing his his lead under that but then when I was overseas they they came in with a, a, a new um, uh, site now the old sites you had to do all of this but the new sites that they came in, all you had to do was set your airspeed and you knew that he was going to be whoever that was flying a pursuit cave curve on you was going to be flying about 400 miles an hour where you were flying about 200 miles an hour and you would just set this and they had a computing and compensating site and in there was a red dot and all you had to do was get that on the on the plane coming in at you mm -hmm. and the 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 uh, site would do all the adjusting of your machine guns so you to worry about them. It was a marvelous thing mm -hmm. and uh, uh, well I was lucky I hit the tail end of the war thank God for that. Now um, was most of your training on the ground when you were in Florida? Uh, no, in, in planes. Uh, I, of, you know, was it mostly uh, in planes? Yeah, yeah, real planes. They were bombers. They were bombers uh, mm -hmm. and you, uh, you had to train to, uh, uh, you had to learn about your uh, uh, turret I was in a uh, hydraulic turret. You learned in that hydraulic turret, and you uh, you shot real bullets. Now this is a very interesting thing. They had Bell. They would fly pursuit curves at you in a bomber, flying Bell Aracoba planes. Now this plane never went into combat, but it was very fast. It was it was it was built in Buffalo, New York very very fast airplane and he would come in and fly pursuit curves at you and you would shoot right at him. We had 30 calibers into the turrets and our bullets were wax but they were fairly accurate. Then you would come down on the ground and uh, you would look at the plane. Now you would be shooting red bullets or blue bullets or green bullets or orange bullets or a different color. Do you see what I'm getting at? Then you would look at this plane and you you had to pass that test too. You had to be able to hit him. And if you didn't, you could wash out from that thing. So that was one of the advanced trainings that we had at Tundell Field. Mm -hmm. And it was all in the air. And not only that, there you had to learn how to parachute out of an uh, out of a plane. Thank God I never had to do it. Did you never had to learn? You never oh, I had to learn, oh. but I I had to know exactly what to do. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, did you ever jump? No, I okay. didn't. Thank God, but I was ready to jump one time. We we our plane got in trouble, and I opened up the hatch, and I was standing right there, ready to go. And I had my hand onto the onto the rip cord. I was ready to go because you don't want to be in a plane when it goes down. Mm -hmm. Nobody lives. 
Nobody lives in a plane when it goes down. They, first of all, you're five miles in the air. It's brutally cold, brutally, brutally cold. You thought this morning was cold? It's 60 below zero up there. You go up five miles, it's 60 below zero. It's brutally cold. Your biggest, your biggest, one of your biggest things you had to learn how to be on oxygen. You, that's one of the things you did in training. You had to be on uh, uh, how to cover your face and all of these things up. Uh, this was extremely important so that you see, if you see somebody in the movies and you see that they don't have their face covered up, he's doing level lot, low level uh, uh, of fighting. Because up there you needed a scarf around your neck, you needed a mask on, your, your, your oxygen mask was on, you needed goggles down here, you had, you know, and, and the helmet on, and the helmet was heated. Your suits have to be heated. You can't live up there. You would get frostbite. You'd get frostbite and your finger, fingers and feet would freeze. So everything had to be, and this, you, 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 got, you got this kind of a training. And then you, after you went through and graduated from high school, you went to advanced school to meet with all of your people and to get, get to know them. And you went through all of this stuff all the time. It had to be second nature to you. Tell me about some of the people you met in advanced school. Oh, wonderful guys. I had a guy, he came here on his honeymoon when he got married after the war. All radio operators are called Sparky, all of them, on every plane that you're on. Uh, Sparky, his name was Kenny Folsom. He uh, later became a uh, champion runner and tennis player as a senior citizen. But Sparky came from Bosquane, New Hampshire. Awful nice gentleman. Uh, he was, and I, I'm going to say this now, I, as you, I told you that I was in the service for two years before I went into this. I was 23 years old when I went into aerial gunnery school. They called me Pop. These were kids. These were kids that were just 18 years old. I was, you see, I was five years older than all of them. Uh, Kenny, uh, Kenny Folsom was from Bosquane, New Hampshire. Uh, there was Harry Boniker. Harry later became a business agent for the Painters Union in Albany, New York. Harry. Uh, be, lied his age and became 18 when he was overseas, flying in combat. 17-year-old kid, uh, Harry Boniker uh, was a good kid and he's still alive. I got a Christmas card from him the other day and from Kenny Folson too. Tex, uh, his name was Cecil Letterbetter and he was our engineer, uh, an awful nice gentleman. Uh, he was the top non-commissioned officer on our plane. And he needed to be because he knew everything about uh, engines and stuff like motors and stuff like that, and the parts of a plane and stuff like that. Tex come from down in uh, uh, Texas, and every kid that comes from Texas, his nickname was Tank. And uh, then there was Jimmy Norduff. He was a uh, Jimmy was from uh, 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 Kansas, and I got a Christmas card from Jimmy the other day. And uh, he, uh, he just lost his wife, poor kid. I feel sorry. He's not a kid anymore. I sent him a card this year and I said, do you realize it's our 60th anniversary that we first met? Uh, and then the, the last one, his name was uh, Dale Penfold. He was from Detroit, uh, Michigan. And Dale was sort of a, 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 a loner, but he was our Sperry Ball guy. I wouldn't have got down in that Sperry Ball guy if you could have paid me a million dollars. I wouldn't have. That was scary. You'd put them in, you'd lock them into that ball and lower them down. And uh, if things went out, uh, it would be very difficult to get them out of there. Uh, but Dale, uh, he was smaller than I was. And uh, he uh, he thrived on it. Other guys didn't want to be tail gunners. And I, and I sort of liked being out there because uh, it was... Uh, it was, it was, uh, but those were the, and the officers, we had, uh, we had a guy, but they, and I never kept in track with the officers, and they dropped off, they never, they didn't keep in track with us either. Uh, some of the crews did keep uh, close to each other, but our officers didn't. Uh, there was uh, uh, Vern Nicholson, uh, and the funniest thing, I, we had three officers, and they were all the same height six foot two 
it takes a big man and a strong man to fly a B-24. That's a big plane, and it's a it's a lot of work. And uh, these guys could they could handle it, you know. And incidentally, we all had to have stick time too. They, they wanted everybody to be able to fly this thing too. Uh, I'm glad I never had to fly it uh, under uh, the wrong circumstances, but I did have stick time. Uh, uh, then there was Kelsey, and. Uh, you know, I can see their name. I can see them, but I can't. They, I can't bring their names back. Kelsey was the. Uh, uh, he was the co-pilot, and Vern was the pilot. Then we had a radio operator. Heck of a nice guy, awful nice gentleman. I can see him. He was a, a dapper sort of a fella, and uh, then the uh, uh, our uh, navigator Bill Hess. I did remember his. I can't remember I, the bombardier's name. Don't want to come up. Um, but when we got overseas, he was pretty good, and uh, he flew with us twice, and never flew with us again. They always they made him a, a, a lead bombardier, and uh, he, he. I guess he did a good job his first two uh, raids, and he never flew with us again. Uh, and I can't I can't bring his name up, uh, but it was. Uh, it was, it was something, and the trip over, oh, and uh, after we left Tyndall Field, Florida, and we went north, and we went back to Westover Field again, and that's where I did my advanced training, and that was simulated flights down over, way over the ocean and back, and way up uh, north and back, and uh, high altitude. Uh, you had to learn how to fly in the, up there. You had to learn to be damn careful, mm -hmm. uh, and you had to learn what the heck to do if the equipment went out. Mm -hmm. And some of the equipment here in the United States wasn't as good as it was when we were issued our, our new stuff and went overseas. And your boots would go out, and and, 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 and they're not going to come down for you. You've got to learn how to keep that foot warm, you know, when it's there. And uh, oh, boy, it's brutal up in that uh, up in that atmosphere. I don't. Uh, I'm glad, well, I suppose all the modern things, there was no heat in our planes, none whatsoever. If you didn't have your equipment, if you had to, if you had to uh, relieve yourself, it was difficult. It was difficult, and a lot of times your flights would be six and seven hours, you know what I'm getting at, and overseas they would be that long. And it was difficult, and these are things that they train people to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not the prettiest subject to talk about, but it, it, it's a reality. Mm -hmm. It's a reality, and they train you good in the Army. But by the same token, when you got overseas, one of the, I'll never forget the first speech that I got by uh, our personnel officer. He said, you are all trained, and it's cost the United States government a lot of money to train you. And you will not miss your turn when you go, and your equipment will work, your guns will shoot, you will do your job, or you will face a general court martial. Don't forget it. Your bombs will be dropped, you bombardiers, your bombs will be dropped, you navigators better hit the targets, you pilots, you don't turn away when flak is rough, and it get it got awful rough sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's the way they, it's, combat is brutal. They train you, but you better, you don't run away. There ain't no place to run in a plane anyway, you know what I'm getting at. There's no place to run, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, when you were going through your training, how were you feeling about this? I loved it. I loved every minute of it. I, honestly, uh, going through training was, uh, uh, it was part of being a man. All of a sudden, you realize that this is not kids. This was not a kids' game. Mm -hmm. uh, all you, all of a sudden, you realize that you were part of the big operation. You knew you were going to go overseas. You knew you were going to go into combat. Uh, the guys training you were all ex-combat veterans, and uh, they were always giving you tips and always things like that. And. Uh, I felt good about it. I was engaged. I had to, I had popped the question to Sophie, and um, I popped the question when I was down in Tendo Field, Florida. 
and uh, she had said yes. And when I, I had a delay in route between what we call a delay in route from Tendlefield to Westover, Massachusetts, uh, I, I hopped a, a ride and got from uh, all the way from Tendlefield, I hopped a ride and got away uh, to Syracuse, New York. From Syracuse, I went back down to Long Island because I had bought a ring for her and uh, went to see her because I had proposed to her by mail. I was afraid. <laughs> I was afraid she would say no any other way. <laughs> but I proposed to her and I took the, it down and I gave her a ring and uh, took her home to, to meet my mother and father. And it was a happy time. Uh, I had 10 days and uh, uh, I took her back home and then I went to, to Massachusetts. Uh, I liked Massachusetts. Uh, we had a happy time up there after we got married. It was wonderful. It was really wonderful. And, uh, but I, I went through all of the training. Okay. I went through all of the training. During the training, what did they tell you about the enemy? What did they tell you about the Italians or the Germans? Well, they didn't tell you too much about the Italians because the Italians had pretty much gotten out of the war. Uh, but Jerry was good, and they taught you the thing that uh, one of the things that you were going to fight was flak. And they said, make no bones about it. Jerry's got the best gun in the in the in the WW2. Uh, they said Jerry has got uh, what they call the 88, and uh, they're good and they're trained good, and the gun is good, and uh, I found it out. Uh, I got hit in the parachute with a uh, piece of flak in the back. I wasn't wounded, but I, it uh, went through my uh, flak suit, and it uh, got into my parachute, and I, I got it. And I don't know, I, I might have turned it over to uh, the society, I don't know. It's, it's a wicked looking piece of metal, it's about, uh, this piece of flak is, uh, see what they would do is shoot these bursts, these, uh, these things up. Now, when you're in combat, you would think that you're saying you're coming in at 22,550 feet. You'd think, well, you're lucky, you know. But Jerry had radar just like we did, and he could tell exactly how high you were. And that first bomb burst would have to be right outside of your window. And you would hear those things ping going through the plane and stuff like that. Well, these, these things would burst open and uh, 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 just explode. And then each one of these would be a small fragment about yay big. Could be about, about the size of your finger like this. Very jagged. I've seen guys with with wounds and stuff like that, they they tear you. You know what I'm getting at? Because they, they would come at a tremendous percussion, and uh, uh, I was lucky. I was lucky. Uh, a couple of our guys got hit. They got uh, the Purple Heart because they got hit. I was lucky. I didn't get hit. I got hit in the back, and uh, my we we wore a protective. When we would hit Flak Alley, what we would call Flak Alley, you would put on a uh, uh, armor plating, and it was. Uh, 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 it was a protection, and it would fit right over my back chute. See, as a tail gunner, I had a back chute, and inside, if I had to bail out, inside my turret was a front chute. You had two chutes. You had a, I had a back chute and a front chute, and uh, never had to use it. Thank God for that. I never had to use it, but I had them, and uh, and they were uh, uh, they were beautiful. The back chute fit because I was a tail gunner. Uh, I didn't have, I took doors off of my, my uh, uh, there was no heat into it, and I took the doors off of my uh, uh, turret because I didn't want anything, if I had to go out, I, uh, out of that plane, I, you know, from the, from the tail to the, where the hatch was, was a distance, and uh, if a plane gets hit, uh, and this is what they teach you, this is what these combat guys that had been there did this, they said, be ready to go. When that guy says, prepare to bail out, uh, you get ready to go. And uh, they had signals if there was no communication that they would push. Do you see what I'm getting at? Uh, if he put two, two buzzes onto that thing, that meant prepare to bail out and you'd get out of your turret if you had time. 
But if the plane got hit and was in trouble, you could be thrown against the housing of the plane and couldn't move because the, the pressure's against you. You couldn't move. So I took the doors right off of my turret and uh, I could have opened the turret way as wide and flopped out of it. Thing. Uh, and, you know, uh, I felt a little lot more comfortable about that than, than any other thing. Uh, am I getting excited? This is I, great. Don't, I don't mean to. <laughs> this is great, Archie. Now, once your training was finished, what was your first assignment? Well, our training was finished and we went to, uh, to uh, Mitchell Field, Long Island, and there's a very interesting story about that. Of course, uh, Sophie lived out on Long Island and I could get a pass to go home because we were all through training and we were just making sure we had to be there to take physical examinations and everything. They didn't want somebody to go that wasn't healthy. Uh, and uh, the last night I was in New York, we had a pass to go into, or in uh, Mitchell Field, we had a pass to go in New York and guess who went with us? Alan Ladd. What a wonderful gentleman. He was a, uh, he was a, uh, a movie star and uh, people will see him, you know, in movies and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, Alan Ladd uh, was in the Air Corps and he went in and we went to the stage door canteen together. And he said that was a mistake. We went on the way back, he said that was a mistake because he was mobbed. He was a big time movie actor and the girls went crazy over him. And all of these girls were showgirls that they had at the, at the State Door Canteen. State Door Canteen was a nice place in New York City. New York was a good liberty town. God bless them. They, they, they showed soldiers uh, a wonderful, wonderful time. I, uh, I didn't talk about that, but they, New York was a great liberty town. And they had the stage door canteen, and then there was a place called 99 Park Avenue that you could go, and you could go there, and you could get uh, uh, baseball tickets, you could get uh, prize fighting tickets, tickets to any show in the city of New York. They always for soldiers, you could go there, and you could get a free ticket, and go. I saw a lot of the the uh, the New York shows during wartime, uh, the best there was, and uh, you'd have the best seat right down in the. Uh, what do they call that down there? The orchestra? The orchestra, right down in the orchestra. And, and uh, I remember one, it was a, a sort of a raunchy type of a play. It was called Early to Bed. And it was, it was, it was but it was, it was, you know, it was very good. And uh, yeah, I, I saw a lot of shows, a lot of musicals. And uh, I did all of those kind of things in New York. And uh, spent a lot of time up to Yankee Stadium. Uh, uh, and uh, even even when I came back from overseas, I took Sophie to the Yankee Stadium, and they gave me a free pass for Sophie and I. Uh, we went in, and I saw Bobby Feller pitch a one hitter against the Yankees. Mm -hmm. I later I later met Bobby Feller here in Elmira. He came here for uh, uh, to promote the uh, uh, Elmira Pioneers, and uh, uh, I was uh, I was the guy assigned to take care of him and like that. And I told him, I said, I've seen you pitch, and you, I saw your first uh, game that you pitched in Yankee Stadium. And he he spoke right up, and he says, I give him one hit too, did I? I said, Yes, you did. Yeah, nice man, awful nice man, Bobby Feller is very, very, very. I met I met some nice people in the service, and I met a lot of Elmira guys all over the world. Right down the street down here is a, is a gas station. It's closed right now. But Joe Foz, I met him in Barrie, Italy. Now, you, you, you want to ask me the question, so go ahead. I get, you know, I get, I reminisce and I talk about the thing. Uh, you never forget the guys that you are in combat with. Never. That's why I can't remember that that bombardier's name. I can't remember it. I got to go home and look it up. I can't remember it. But you never forget the guys that you you go into combat with, guys that you depend on. Now we all in a bomber. Everybody, when the plane comes on the tail, that was my responsibility, 
and they depend on you. When a plane comes in from the waste, our radio operator takes care of that on one side, and our uh, um, the um, navigator took care of the other side. See, the navigator, even though they were officers, they had to go through uh, uh, training to be gunners. Everybody had to be able to do something else. And, uh, yeah, I get in reminiscing, but I went, I, I had that time in New York City, and I went home to see Soapy a couple of times, and uh, then I knew I was going overseas, and uh, we went to New York that night and uh, with uh, all the crew, and we had a great time. And the next morning we took off and went north to Bangor, Maine. Uh, from Bangor, Maine, we flew to Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, from Reykjavik, Iceland, we, uh, oh, <laughs> in Reykjavik, Iceland, we landed there, and the ground was as bare as this room is. And a uh, southerner, what they call a southerner, came in, which dumps a lot of snow on Reykjavik because it's up there in the, in 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 the 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 uh, oh, I'm trying to think of it. There's a name for it, uh, jet stream that comes up into there. It snowed two feet overnight. I couldn't believe it, but uh, uh, and we had the biggest poker game I ever. Got. <laughs> Ah, uh, you had to buy the seat to get into one, you know, there were so many guys wanting to get in that big poker game. And uh, the poker game lasted for nine days. We were in Reykjavik for nine days, the poker game lasted for, so you would, if you were ahead and were winning pretty good money, you would hire some guy to sit in your seat and tell him, be careful, be careful, I want to get back into the seat, unless you got a real good hand, be careful. But uh, you'd go to eat or stuff like that. Uh, yeah, that was it. Reykjavik, they had Quonset huts and a pot belly stove in the middle of them. But I never forgot it. The morning we got up and we opened that door to get out the thing, there was nothing but snow. We had to push the snow away from it. I got a picture of me standing on top of that Quonset hut with, with all of my crew and like that. Reykjavik, we never got out of the air base. Uh, all we wanted to do was get out of there. We, you know, I mean, that was a lot of snow. And it was the wind would blow. Interview for the Veterans History Project with Archie Kiefer. You were talking about Reykjavik? Okay. Well, we were in Reykjavik. And we were happy to... And the snow left just as quick as it came. All of a sudden, a southern wind came in and the snow just... just it runs off there because it's all rock and, you know, it was bare ground in there. And so uh, we, that we inspected the plane and uh, packed the plane and uh, took off from uh, Reykjavik. And we flew uh, east and we came in over Scotland. And uh, uh, Scotland was a rugged country, mountainous, very rugged. And then we flew over Northern Ireland, and all of a sudden the grass was green there, you know what I mean? It was such a welcome sight. And we flew down over Northern Ireland, and then across the, uh, I guess it's the Irish Sea there, in between England and there, across the Irish Sea, and we landed in um, uh, Wales. And Wales interested me because uh, uh, one branch of my family were Welsh, and they came from there. Uh, and uh, we were assigned our uh, uh, there in Wales. It was uh, still spring, still cool. We had Quonset huts. The food was good, excellent. Uh, we were going to be there for a couple of days. Uh, we worked on our plane. We got that batter back in good ship shape. We had an extra day, and we uh, so we went into town. The houses were beautifully laid out. The streets were narrow. Uh, the houses had thatch roofs on them. Uh, there were stone fences all over, and they were all painted white. It was a very clean country. Uh, and uh, 
I remember going into town. This is a shocking thing. I went into town and thought I was in England where I would hear people talk English. Well, you can't believe what the Welsh language sounds like. I, I never heard my, I, I wasn't around when my great-grandfather and them were around and I suppose they spoke the native tongue because the Welsh have kept their, they, tell me, they told me that the Welsh have kept their native tongue. It's an ancient uh, tongue. Uh, it's, well, the Germans used the word Aaron. Well, it's an Aaron tongue come from Europe or some place like that. It's an ancient, ancient tongue long before the long before the the Romans went to England, which they started, they came early uh, time of Christ, uh, you know, and the Aaron language is was there ahead of time. It's a crazy sounding thing to hear an Englishman talking this kind of language, you know. So, but I uh, that's what I remember about. I remember the houses, the the white fences, and the narrow roads. Uh, and the reason is that uh, these were people on this bus that we rode to go into town and we went into uh, a pub uh, and we had uh, warm beer and uh, that sort of thing. But we did not, I did not see any of the famous castles or any of that. I, w I would have liked to have seen. If I'd known now what I'd known then, or if I'd known then what I know now, I would have gone and seen a couple of the castles or something like that. Because I had a whole day, mm -hmm. and I didn't, and we just uh, a bunch of us went to town, and we. Uh, uh, I remember that night that they had uh, a dance, and there was. Uh, uh, I went to the dance, and the girls were uh, uh, British, uh, British military people, and uh, American wax over there. Uh, the wax were assigned to the air, air base. I don't know the. I don't remember the name of the air base there, but we were there for. I'm. I'm going to say two and a half days. We left there and we flew south, right out over the ocean. We flew right out over the ocean, and uh, south, in the Atlantic Ocean. Bypassed all of Belgium and all of that because there was war there. I bypassed all of that. Flew over uh, Portugal and. Uh, uh, flew down into uh, North Africa, into Marrakech, North Africa, uh, to an air base there in Marrakech, and all of a sudden we got out of the plane, and from it being in Reykjavik four days ago, with it being cold, and then it was damp in England, or in well, Wales, uh, flying to Marrakech, North Africa. We got in, when we got out of the plane, we had our flight jackets on, wool jackets, you know, and all of this. Man, we couldn't get rid of them fast enough. It was, you know, it was, <laughs> was up in the 80s. It was beautiful. And uh, it was desert there. Uh, the, the airfield was out in the desert. Uh, we only stayed in Marrakech overnight. The only time I went into the base was to eat, and then I was assigned to guard the plane at night. Uh, I wish it had one of my war dogs, uh, but nobody bothered me, and the plane was locked up, so they would have had to break something to get in. And I, once again, I was well, I was armed. Uh, one thing you had to learn when you were in the Air Corps is how to shoot a 45 uh, automatic pistol didn't like the thing. I liked a 45, uh, a pistol rather than an automatic. Automatic jumps to, uh, jumps too hard and uh, it's hard to load where a pistol you just eject the, the empty shells and drop the others in and it's much easier to handle. I think it's a little more accurate shooting too. But anyway, I was armed so I didn't worry. And the next morning uh, we had breakfast and uh, toiletries and that and we left and we flew to uh, Tunis, Tunisia, uh, Tunis in Tunisia and a very old, old place and I had a wonderful experience there because we were there again. We had some plane problem and we had to put it in, uh, let some mechanics work on it and they said we were going to be there for three days. So uh, 
Uh, the first day I went into Tunisia, a very old city, a very uh, city with a big boulevard down it, old buildings. I went to a cathedral in Tunisia. Uh, it was beautiful. I enjoyed myself. I had a good meal in there. Uh, didn't have to anything to do with the the uh, local people. Uh, but then the next day I went to a place called Carthage. Carthage had a was the same thing as the Colosseum is in Rome. It was a big amphitheater. It's where they fed, where the Romans fed people and things and had the gladiators and all of the same as they had in the in the Colosseum. Uh, it, it gives you a very awesome feeling. I found a, I found a copper coin and I looked it up, and it was an ancient coin that I found in in the, in the amphitheater in Carthage. Those are the main things that I remember there. Really didn't have too much interest to go in. I went into uh, into Tunis, and I went to Carthage, and that was mainly the main things I wanted to see. Now, did you go alone, or did you the guy? Oh no, I went with Sparky, and Tex. Uh, the three of us went. And uh, three of us were pretty good buddies, and uh, we, we, we did a lot of things together. We got to be better buddies. Uh, uh, and then we left there and flew to Italy. Mm -hmm. I wrote down where we landed, but I'm not going to tell you. And uh, we stayed uh, overnight where we landed. Uh, and uh, the next morning we got into uh, six by sixes, uh, which is an army truck with dual wheels on the back end, two sets of wheels on the back, and uh, they, that's a typical army truck. Loaded our, our bags in, and uh, we went first. We went to Barry, Italy, and just to that's where we caught the the northern. Uh, a highway going north, and we headed north on that highway. Still there the same, I'll bet it's not changed a bit. Uh, good highway. We headed north. Uh, it was a highway built by Mussolini and his, his factory. And uh, we kept going, and uh, we went through a town called Cherignola. And I never forgot that because there was a beautiful, gorgeous cathedral in Cherignola huge cathedral. And uh, we went just on the other side of uh, Cherignola, turned off and went to the, our outfit. And I, I was assigned to the 459th Bomb Group, 759, uh, 756 Bomb Squadron. It was still early spring. There was snow on the ground. It was cold and it was squishy. And they brought us up to an empty lot. There was a what they call a, a big folded up in the mud. And that was my welcome to the 756 bomb. I'll never forget it. Cold, damp. We had all of our stuff and we were all clean and like that, you know. And here's mud. We got to put this tent up in mud. We put the damn tent up. <laughs> We put it up. We put our bunks up. They, they, there was also they. We were issued bunks, and uh, that was a horrible night. My first night in that outfit. Horrible, uncomfortable night. But the nice thing they gave you a week to get settled, and they said, "Now you got to make this tent comfortable. Uh, different things you can get and." I took a look around and I found out that uh, uh, they had some uh, uh, what we call toothy block. It was a sandstone block that was 16 inches long, 8 by 8, and uh, you could buy them, which we did. And I put extension on our tent because I was a mason. 
guys come over to watch me and the uh, local guys come over, the uh, local Italian, one guy says to me, good, good, I never forgot, multi, multi, he says to me, you know, because I knew what to do, see, and I built this extension onto our tent, and the tent would have a fly leaf over, that could stretch over the top of it, and uh, we extended it, we built a stove, made a stove out of a 50 drum, uh, we had, uh, we burnt, uh, uh, they, they furnished us with fuel oil and we'd throw a little 100 octane gasoline in it to ri richen it up a little bit, especially when it needed cleaning. <laughs> but uh, built a stove, uh, some guys were, everybody is handy, you know what I mean. And Penfold was a, we, he was an iron worker and he knew how to cut steel. They made this stove and we made, uh, we had uh, in the middle, uh, in the uh, uh, cases that we used that uh, they shipped the ammunition over was uh, beautiful lumber and we made, a, we made a wood floor into it to get off in the darn ground. We made a wood floor in, into it and we put a wooden door in the front. We had a good door and a flap. Uh, we built uh, we built uh, racks to, to hold our clothes up, a uh, big clothes rack, and every guy was assigned a certain uh, distance. Uh, we had one light bulb, uh, but it was good enough. We we built a desk, and if a guy wanted to write a letter home or something like that, you could send it to desk. And we built chairs and a desk, and uh, uh, I had I had a uh, uh, they they issued you a um, uh, uh, mattress cover, mattress cover. They issue issue you a mattress cover, and I went out. I went to a farmer next door and got some fresh straw. Mm -hmm. So I had a straw tick. I appropriated a few sheets in Reykjavik. That's a, that's an honest way of saying that we. From the army, but we, you know, we kept them in the army, and I slept between sheets on a straw tick, and I was very, very comfortable. And I had uh, appropriated a couple extra blankets. The army would issue you two, and so I had, I was very warm and very comfortable. I had a very nice sack because uh, the bunks are, were wood. Uh, they were, uh, you know, they had wood. Uh, 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 legs in that, and uh, they had uh, canvas for that. I was comfortable. That was, it was a nice thing. And then, and then we did some. Then we we were always we could do those things, but we had to go for tra training. What was it, what they would call uh, uh, authentic combat training. And uh, uh, I never forgot they had a they had a simulated uh, bomb run uh, air to ground. And they gave us targets that we had to shoot at. And the reason you did this was that the crews would learn to, to operate together. And when we would come up to a target and uh, Sparky would yell out, uh, uh, and everything was done by the clock. If something was at, uh, at uh, say, a quarter of, that was, uh, uh, they would say it was, uh, at, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the thing, what we say, that would be, let's see, nine that would be, uh, let's see, eight, nine, ten, that would be, that would be 10 o'clock, that would be 10 o'clock, I was trying to think of the calendar, couldn't remember the calendar, but that would become automatic to you, and you would do this training. So Sparky called out this, this uh, target, and I wheeled my thing down, know that it was going to be at that uh, place at a clock. And when it came up, I started firing my machine gun, firing ahead of it, knowing that the, the, the bullets would go this way, see. And then, then you would watch them, and they exploded. The bullets were exploding. And I, I yelled back to, uh, and we had a combat guy with us. I yelled back through the intercom, hey, something wrong with these bullets. They're, they're exploding. And the guy come back to me, and he says, welcome to combat. Exploding bullets, that was illegal. Mm. United States Army, we did every trick that there was. 
We didn't start the war, we finished it. But exploding bullets? Uh, I guess there was an international agreement that they wouldn't use exploding bullets or something, I don't know. I, I really don't know, but uh, I never realized that. Uh, and we had, we, our bullets were exploding. And then we had, uh, we had bullets. Uh, I didn't have to, I didn't have to load them. Uh, they had armor, what we call gra ground armors, and uh, had 1,200 rounds of ammunition in my, my machine gun. I had more than anybody else did. Uh, and uh, they were all armed and ready and everything. The only thing I had to do was there was a, uh, something within the gun I just had to adjust a little bit. To, to, it, you didn't want those guns to be able to fire when they were on the ground. Because when you went on a combat raid and you were headed toward the target, the skipper would check your guns, and then you would turn them on. We always would turn them on early, but we would then you would check your guns to make sure that they would. Uh, it uh, those were those were things that you learned to do. You know what I'm getting at? Uh, then we went on to combat. Uh, what was your first combat mission? It was a marshalling yard. A marshalling yard is, is nothing but a, uh, we would have one here in Elmira where the trains would all, where they would, they, where they would change in cars and everything like that. It wasn't a station, it was a marshalling yard. Of thing. And they, is, periodically the Germans would, uh, would fix them because they had, they had a good, the Italians had a pretty good train system, see? And uh, uh, Jerry would, uh, and that's one thing the Italians did. We'd go bomb them and then they'd fix them. And they were good at it. And you, you, that was something that you had to do all the time because you wanted to disrupt all of the material coming to the German army. Because the German army, when I got over there, was still down below the Po Valley. And uh, they were only maybe 150, 200 miles up the, up the, up the line, see? But, uh, and the, that was our first raid, and uh, I never forgot it because uh, uh, we knew we had we had heard about flak, but it takes the personal experience to uh, to, and you never get used to it. The first burst of flak I saw was maybe thirty yards out from my window, and it just boom like that, you know. I was like a, I was like a turtle. I pulled my head in. I was, you know, what is this? And, and that uh, one there, one there, one underneath, and one over the top. That 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 those gunners had us bracketed. Boy, I was I was scared, you know. And there's nothing you can do. There's no the the Jerry knows that they're good, and so he's not going to be flying at you. And you hit that you hit that. Uh, Oh, there's a name for it, but uh, once you get on your line of target, they set the plane and then the bombardier takes over. Or the navigator takes over and he toggles the bomb to the head bombardier. And uh, you fly in a straight line. You don't, no divasiveness of whatsoever. You fly in a straight line. And those, if those guns get you bracketed, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're trying to kill you. And it, it was, and they were good. They were good. Uh, I'm still here. Thank God for that. Uh, I think I had somebody up right here on my shoulder all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was the first raid, and I'll never forget it. It was the hardest ten miles that I ever flown in my life. They they started they started uh, uh, shooting at us ten miles out, and we went through the target. And j as soon as you get past the target. You do a evasive action, but you have to do it with seven planes. Now these are big bombers. In seven planes, you make a divestive. You know, there was many times that the plane would run into another plane. Mm -hmm. Those guys are just as scared as I was. You know what I'm getting at? Many of them were green. There's no protection up there. There's no, you know, there's no. It's wide open. How did, how did the guys in your in your plane, how did the crew you were with respond to this? Were Same as I did. They were so doggone scared it wasn't even funny. And uh, we couldn't wait to get down out of altitude. See, you're, you're, 
uh, you're in high altitude and you take the evasive action and uh, you got to stay until you get into a safe zone, you got to stay in that altitude and then your fighters pick you up because your fighters aren't going to go into that flak alley with you. They're going to go on the outside to protect you. And they're not going to get in Flack Alley because they don't want to get shot at either. No, we had we had the best fighter plots in the whole world. They were the the Tuskegee uh, black fighter pilots, and I got a buddy that was into it. Uh, I didn't know that at the time. I never knew what ever happened to to him. You know, your classmates they go this way and that way and. But this classmate, he became, and he became, he was decorated and everything else. Uh, Do you remember his name? Oh, sure. That's Clarence Dart. Okay. Clarence and I have remained friends our whole life. He came here to Elmire, and he came here and gave a program for us here, uh, you know. Uh, and he and I uh, went up to Elmire Free Academy, our high school, and uh, we gave a program together, Clarence and I. He, uh, they were great fighter pilots, but, uh, and they protected you, you know. Uh, fortunately, I didn't have any enemy fighters. I didn't have any enemy fighters. The our protection drove them all off all the time, and uh, they uh, then you would get protection of in them, and then you would start to lower yourself down out of altitude, and when you got down to ten thousand feet, uh, the pilot would say the smoking lamp is lit. That meant that you were down to 10,000 feet. Then you could take that oxygen mask off and you wouldn't get frostbite on your face and stuff like that. It wasn't as cold, bitter cold. And you would, everybody would grab a smoke. We all smoked. Everybody smoked. I'm telling you, your nerves were about, you know. Everybody smoked and everybody would have a smoke. And normally we would come down the Adriatic Sea. You'd come back to your air base and you'd do a victory roll when you would come over to the air base and you'd do a victory roll and come out, put your flaps down and your wheels down and then you would come in and land. First people that you would meet there would be the Red Cross. God bless them. Do you want me to turn off the camera for a minute? No, I'm all right. You're okay? I hear a lot of downgrade the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. They were there in combat all the time. And they would meet you. And we had a girl. Oh, she was a sweetheart. She never dated an enlisted man. She always date officers. I remember that. Uh, oh. But she would meet you there with hot coffee and homemade uh, donuts. Yeah, she was, she was an angel. Boy, she was a sweetheart. Never missed her. She was always there. Do you remember her name? No, no, I don't. I don't remember her name. Uh, I've got it wrote down in my daily diary someplace, but I, I don't have it. She was, she was so nice. She was so nice. I do remember the priest's name. Uh, there's no, when you're in combat, there's, uh, there ain't no atheists in combat. There's no atheists in combat. Everybody who was Catholic would go to confession. Everybody would go to mass. And we would go to the cathedral. Well, every Sunday they would have a beautiful uh, mass at, at the cathedral, and uh, you would, uh, I'd love to go there because it was, uh, the only trouble was they would have their own priest sometimes, but if you made the American mass, why well, they would have an American priest. Our priest's name was St. John, Father St. John. I remember him very, very well. But. Those are tough memories. But, like I say, I was lucky. We had we had things. We had uh, shows over there overseas. 
Uh, they would come right to the base, the uh, USO. What kind of shows did you see? Oh, generally uh, dancers, singers, uh, Frank Sinatra, mm -hmm. people like that, you know, great, great singers. I saw Frank Sinatra in Italy. He could speak Italian just like a native. <laughs> And that was my first raid, but uh, I went on to other raids, and uh, I went uh, in support of the uh, uh, went on raid uh, support of the Eighth Army, and its kick off into the Po Valley. And the following day, I went to the uh, uh, British. Wait a minute, it was the American Fifth, and it was the British Eighth. I went on support uh, thing. What we did was uh, pattern bombing. And uh, we pattern bombed for uh, 20 miles. And what they would use was small bombs, pattern bombs. And they would just, uh, these bombs would, they would go out and they would just, uh, one plane would let them and then another following plane would let them and then another plane would let them and like this. And we did it for 20 miles. And then the British 8th went, or the, the American 5th, and then the next day the British 8th went right to pattern bombing that we did. And they invaded the Po Valley, and once they got into the Po Valley, uh, the war wasn't much going to last much longer. And uh, that was some of the important things that we did. Uh, I went on to uh, I went up to Vienna on another raid. I went to uh, uh, another marshalling yard, but I remember Vienna because the flak was so heavy. And I remember another thing. I always had an interest in uh, cathedrals and big buildings because I was a mason. I was, you know, I I wanted to build things like that. But they had a beautiful big cathedral in Vienna, and you could see it from way up in the air. You could see it. It was called Saint Stephen's. Uh, I looked the name up later, but I saw it. I saw it from the air, and uh, thank God we didn't bomb around around Saint Stephen's. And if they did, it was uh, it was not intentional. Now sometimes we did bomb intentionally in places that they weren't supposed to. The uh, reason is those bombardiers had to get rid of those bombs. And sometimes things would happen and they couldn't get rid of them. So on the way back, I mean maybe the mechanical things in the, in the plane wouldn't uh, let the bombs go. So on the way back, they would pick a target out and, and bomb that target. Uh, not pretty, because it would be some off in the corner place where somebody wasn't even involved in the, in the war or anything like that, and they'd have to go through there and boom, knock the whole city right out. Mm -hmm. Because we carried 2,000 uh, uh, pounders, and we would carry three 2,000 pounders. That's 6,000 pounds of bombs. My plane, the B-24, was the best plane. Now they, we called the B-17 Hollywood bombers. We carried more bomb load higher and farther and faster than the B-17 did any day in a week. Now the B-17 was a good, good plane. Don't get me wrong. And a lot of guys flew in it. And it was a, it was a, uh, a thing between B-24 guys and B-17 guys. But the truth of the matter is, and the statistics proves me right, that the B-24 was a better plane than B-17. And all planes will not fly if they're hit. Now, the B-17 had a good uh, reputation for staying in the air. The B-24 had a nickname called the Flying Boxcar, and uh, uh, the 17 guys would like to uh, run us down, and we like to run the B-17 guys down. I was happy flying in the B-24. It was a lot of airplane, and there's only one that's still flying to this day, and I'm happy to say that I sent money to activate another one, hopefully that it will. Uh, I did. There were a lot of things in 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 Europe that that I did in combat. Uh, the that if I'd known, all I could think of was on that first raid was, why in the hell did you ever volunteer for this? 
I didn't have to volunteer for it. I did. And then I got married, and I had a sweet wife at home. Oh, idiot. I was an idiot. And uh, many times, all I could think of was Sophie. That's all I could think of. You know, when you're in combat, and they're trying to kill you. And man, they're trying to kill you. And we'd come back and, and count the holes in, in, into the planes, you know, and wonder, how come you didn't get hit? Mm -hmm. hmm. How many combat missions do you think you flew? I, only, I, I know how many I do. I only flew in five. Thank oh, okay. the good Lord for that. We had a little problems, and uh, uh, so uh, I flew in five, and then uh, uh, things got broken up in our crew, and... Uh, why did that happen? Well, the bombardier was assigned to somebody else, and uh, they needed a pilot, and uh, and uh, then they needed a Sperry ball gunner. You know, uh, those guys uh, would get scarce, and and uh, uh, I. But uh, I flew five raids, and then uh, I guess maybe because of my age or something like that, and then too I had something happen in my last raid. I had the damn dust thing, I, all of a sudden my machine guns wouldn't work. And that goes on your record. My machine gun wouldn't work. No, no matter what I tried to do, I couldn't get them damn machine guns to work. And uh, I turned them over to Tex, who was, uh, the, was the engineer, and he was supposed to be the, uh, the head of everything, and he couldn't get them to work. And uh, Once we got down, I, I think they froze up is what I think they did. Uh, I think the there's there's a, uh, I can't think of the name of it, but there's a, a, an attachment you have to adjust into them, and I think that froze up, and I it never uh, it never would uh, hit the and allow the guns to go off, and that went on my record, and maybe they they said well he's old and you know he's older than and his guns didn't work, and so I never. Our crew got busted up, and so then you 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 just had to wait till they would choose you to fly in a on a, on a group. I never I never flew again. So what did you do? Oh, I trained people. I was a hell of a, a trainer. You know what I mean? That was you know uh, in in things of that nature. Uh, I I knew guns real well, and that's what was disturbing to me that my mm -hmm. that my machine guns failed me, and when when the, it was the only time, and it was the last time I flew, and uh, and then I just got into things. Uh, the war got over, you know, was getting over, and uh, uh, back again to security. I'm glad I did. I had more fun. Uh, they looked up my record, and they called me in, and they said, Sergeant, we understand that you were a sergeant of the guard, and uh, you're good at security in that. Would you... Uh, be willing to take a, an assignment. Well, what the heck? I wasn't, you know. I, I said, yeah, but I don't want to lose my flight time and stuff like. That's money. You fly, you get paid more money. And they said, no worry, we'll get you the flight time. So sure enough, I I went and they were. Uh, this was after the war. They uh, they the war came to a close real quick, and. Uh, uh, I remember we went to mass. And we said they had a special mass for all the guys that got killed in the war, and I went to it. I never forget it. It was a beautiful mass. Where did they have it? Uh, they had it in the cathedral, and it was a beautiful mass. In and that little Italian town. Yeah. Okay. Well, Sherignola was about three hundred thousand people. It okay. was not, you know, it's not it, was, it, it was a, it, and it's still there, and the cathedral is still there, but. Uh, uh, so I went back to being sergeant of the guard again, and uh, actually I was in charge of uh, a guard's uh, outfit, and we would guard old bases that they didn't, uh, they weren't abandoned and stuff like that. And I set my own schedules and uh, wrote passes for guys to go. And I said, now look at if you guys will double up on this guard instead of pulling a six-hour trick, pull a, pull a twelve-hour trick. I'll give you guys a three-day pass, and you can go. Places and uh, I and I had an assistant, and I did the same thing, and I went to Rome. I never would have gotten to Rome. I went to Rome, uh, you know, and it was, it was, and I got a plane ride up to Rome, and uh, I was up there, uh, and uh, another time I went to, over to uh, uh, Naples, and they had the best Red Cross place in Naples of all in Italy that there was. 
you could get anything. It was just like a hotel. In fact, it was a hotel. Uh, it only cost you 50 cents for a room overnight. They had a good chow. They had good food. You could get a shave and a haircut. Your boots cleaned. You could, you know, it was it was wonderful. Good clean bed. It was a marvelous place. I went to I went to uh, Naples for two days. I went to Rome for uh, three. So all during that period of time when I was doing, and then when I got back, I went in to see the. They called me back, and uh, I I did this trick of duty, and uh, the 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 first sergeant of the whole outfit it was in a. The, I had been transferred to the 455th uh, bomb uh, group, and uh, the first sergeant says. Sergeant, you've been such a good man, and you did such a good thing, and everybody came back, and they were all happy, and uh, I liked the way you operated. How would you like to go on a rest leave? Well, I, he says, I, where, do you, where have you got to go? He said, well, there's Florence. I said, uh, uh, how about Venice? Yes, Venice. So I went to Venice for five wonderful, beautiful days. Oh, was it good. And I met guys. That's where I met the Japanese American guys. I went broke when I was in Venice, running out of money. I bought sightseeing or playing cards. Uh, no, 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 no. I bought, I bought, I bought soapy. Uh, I bought her some cameos. That's where they manufacture them. I bought her real good cameos at the, at Venice. I bought them in the Red Cross in Venice. And uh, see, wherever you went, there was a Red Cross, and they would not let them cheat you. Do you see what I'm getting at? So I bought them. I uh, bought uh, cameos, and I did things. And then uh, uh, we would drink a lot of beer. They had real beer there, and uh, 3.2, but it was real beer. And uh, we, uh, I drank. And I met these Japanese uh, Americans there, and uh, I bought the last drink, and I had very few lira in my pocket. And I, I said to this one guy. And he had an American name, but he was as Japanese as anybody, but he spoke American just like we did, you know, because he was born and raised in America. But anyway, I said to him, hey, I, uh, that's it for, uh, they called me Whitey, I had blonde hair like you got. Uh, I said, uh, I, that's it for me, I don't have any more money. And he said, well, what's the matter, Whitey, do you need some money? And I said, why? And he says, he pulled out a lot of bills like you wouldn't believe. And in fact, I gave it. It's, it's into that. I gave you that into that thing. That short snorkel. Yeah. Well, he pulled out a lot and he said, how much do you want? Would you like $500? And I said, you're kidding. He said, no, I, we got all kinds of money. We cracked a bank on the way up. <laughs> that meant on the way up the, uh, up the, up the thing. He said, well, they, they get in the way and there's these bills flying all over. <laughs> And they were good. They were good up there. So I, uh, they weren't any good down in southern Italy, but they were good up in northern Italy. Yet. And so I stayed with them, and uh, we got to be pretty good friends. I wonder whatever happened to them. We went to the opera in 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 uh, uh, in Venice. We went to the opera, and we had to, we had the uh, uh, they had a place where you could have uh, wine and uh, like that, and we had the. What do you call him, Diva, the the, the head singer? Mm -hmm. We had her sitting with us, mm -hmm. and she was oh, a magnificent singer. And she came and sat with us and had a, a, a sip of wine and like that. Oh, we had a gondolier. We had a private, just like a private taxi. Oh, we, I went all over in Venice, and uh, I went to mass in Venice at uh, St. Mark's Cathedral. Mm -hmm. The Doge's Palace was uh, open, but not the Campanelli with the, the tower and the chimes are. That wasn't open, and uh, but I, uh, uh, Venice is a gorgeous, gorgeous city, and I had a I stayed in the Hotel Dardanelle over in Lido Beach. Uh, it was it was a nice time, and uh, I was there for five days. Now, how many of the Nisei soldiers were you hanging out with? How many were there in the group? Oh. There was maybe a half a dozen or something, and they were on rest leave just like we were. Mm -hmm. They were on a rest leave just like we were. Uh, the army did that to you. They would, uh, and they probably the army probably after the war probably had maybe a half a dozen places where you could go. Uh, I know Florence was one place. 
uh, I, uh, uh, others, uh, Rome, places like that. I, I had been to Rome, so I didn't. I wanted to go someplace else, and and I did, and and I had. It was memorable, mm -hmm. and I brought uh, back, uh, and I've got. Uh, I I mailed Sophie uh, cards uh, from Venice, and uh, I've still got them cards because mm -hmm. she saved them. Did yeah. you write to Sophie a lot? Every day, mm -hmm. every did single day. Did she write day. to you? Oh yes. Yeah. But a lot of times my mail would come. I'd get a dozen at a time. Uh huh. So it was, it was really uh, yeah. unpredictable. Yeah, it was unpredictable, and it was a, it was the uh, combat was over, and then it was back to guard duty again, and back to uh, down to Naples, mm -hmm. and uh, once again I got down to Naples, and uh, they take a look at your record, and they seen this guard duty. You know what I'm getting at? And <laughs> once again I'm, a, they said. Sergeant, while you're here, you're going to be in charge of the sergeant of the, uh, one of the tricks of sergeant of the guard. And uh, so I said, okay. And so I said, what are we going to guard? Well, you're going to guard, uh, they had this great big huge compound, everything in it. And you guard it on the outside. And I took one and I said, you don't have no guard dogs. You don't have anything like that. And the guy says, uh, no. And I said, well, haven't you gotten in some trouble? And he says, yeah, there's been fellows that have attacked him. And I said, well, wait just a minute. I, first, I got to see the squad that I'm going to guard. I'm going to be in charge of. And uh, I said, besides, I want a 45 Thompson. I don't want this pistol. I want a 45 Thompson. And I want my men to have something that's a, a weapon. And do these guys know how to use them? Well, they said, no, they don't. And I said, oh, boy. I said, do you know how dangerous this is to guard something like this where the underworld would get want to get into there? Do you see what I mean? There was all kinds of black market down in, in Naples. And uh, so I, I, guard, I, I got the guys together and I told them, I said, now look at this, there's no piece of cake. You could get your throat cut and those people wouldn't think a thing about it. Uh, you could, uh, you got to be on alert, and I'm going to check you every hour. No sleeping. I'm going to check every one of you every hour. And if you get, if you get scared about anything, take your sidearm out and shoot it. That'll scare people. They'll know you're armed. Shoot it into the fence. But you know, don't be a hesitate to use the thing. And. Uh, one of the guys come to me and he said, gee, Sergeant, we hate to see you leave. You know what the heck you're doing. Well, I'd had so much experience in doing it. And, uh, but I, I, in 10 days, I was over and uh, they had processed me and uh, I got a slow boat back to, they wanted to know if I wanted to fly back. Air Corps guys, they'd fly back a lot of times. I said, no, I want to go home by uh, uh, ship. And I, uh, I came by Liberty ship. When was that? Uh, in August. Was that 45? Yeah, mm -hmm. August of 45. That you started back? And how yeah. long did it take? Well, uh, I think it took us about 10 days to come through. Mm -hmm. uh, we got buzzed at uh, Gibraltar by the uh, British. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they had a special Spitfires. And uh, then we went out in the ocean. And I didn't like being down in the hold. They had bunks somewhat like those racks are there, you know, and you'd fit into them like this and only have about that room. I couldn't stand it. And you were down underneath and I didn't like that. So I went up and I found the, uh, they had a whole bunch of uh, rafts piled up. These were, you know, uh, they needed a lot of rafts because there was a lot of soldiers there. Uh, it was, um, I let the, the things down and I made it about four foot deep. I took my shoulder half up. And uh, Sparky was with me. Sparky was with me, and I said, "Sparky, I'm going to fix up a bunk up there." And he, he, we both fixed up a bunk there, and we went up uh, on the top. And uh, we stayed and rode uh, when the weather was foul. We rode up there. We had a great time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long did it take to cross the Atlantic? About ten days, and we mm -hmm. landed. Uh, we landed in VJ Day in Boston, Massachusetts. What was that like? Well. <laughs> The boats came out to meet us, and they had uh, these uh, uh, fire boats, you know, and all the, the greetings and everything. The war was over. Uh, peace had been, you know, 
and uh, it was it was a happy time. I remember that I got off from that boat, and we got onto a train, and the train pulled away from the uh, harbor there and stopped, and right across the street, you got to understand everything that you got in beer was issued, and you got so much a week. And I would, I used to love beer, oh man. But anyway, there I saw a sign and it said beer, you know what I'm getting at? And I jumped off the train, ran across and said to the guy, give me a beer. And it was a dime. And uh, he, gave, he, he, he drew the beer, put it up on the bar, I took one look at it and I said, no, that's enough. Because you could get to be an alcoholic. And I did not. From that day on, I restricted my drinking. And uh, I was married, and uh, you know, you, you don't want to be in an old house. Mm -hmm. Things are different when you get back into this country. Now, when did you see Sophie after you got back? Uh, I went to Camp Miles Standish. I was there for two days. I was issued, uh, they took all of my, uh, they took my parachute and all my air uh, equipment, uh, my weapons. Uh, I got, uh, I disarmed a, uh, I disarmed a German pilot when I was overseas and took his 40, or his uh, Luger and uh, I claimed it as a war uh, uh, trophy. Uh, can you shut this thing off a minute? Sure. I got this. Okay. Well this was during, uh, this was during wartime. We were still at, uh, we were still at, at war and uh, uh, I was on guard duty and all that because I had a lot of experience at it. And uh, being sergeant of the guard, this plane came in and landed at our field. Now a, a plane can surrender by lowering his wheels and his flex, uh, flaps and then they would come in and land. Well being sergeant of the guard, uh, it was my job, but this guy came in and we were on alert and uh, he came in and being sergeant of the guard, I, I went and met him. And uh, he uh, got out of his plane and he said, uh, surrender. And I said, uh, give me your pistol. And he handed it over to me. And that's how I got it. I didn't, he handed it to me uh, free of his choice. And I kept the pistol. I declared it as a war trophy. Uh, I brought it back to the United States. A lot of officers tried to get that pistol away from me. Uh, I never would, uh, do it. and I brought it back. And I had it here in this country, and I used it, and I had a lot of ammunition for it because it was easy to get overseas. But uh, uh, Luger uh, ammunition is in millimeter, and uh, it was a little difficult to get here and very expensive. So I swapped it off. Uh, I wanted another target uh, gun, so I swapped my Luger off. But I have a license. I have it in my pocket. And it, it says on to that license, uh, Luger. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that's how I got it. How long do you think you held on to it? Oh, I don't know. Probably 10 years after I came back into this country. Into a, a, uh, a shooting group uh, that liked to shoot. And uh, I had, uh, I, I, I tra traded it in and I got more for it than what this gun cost. And uh, it's funny, I, I've got these guns and I, I'm thinking of getting rid of all of them, you know, that I've got. But uh, I got a 8-inch uh, uh, barrel police positive 22 Colt pistol. And it's a very, very accurate uh, uh, gun. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't need them anymore and I don't do that anymore. And, but it was, it was something that was part of my life. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Now, what did you and Sophie do next after the war was over? Well, it was very simple. I was, uh, I had finished, uh, I, I had two years in as a bricklayer apprentice. And uh, I came back to uh, Elmira. I worked six months again as a bricklayer apprentice. Uh, I had, when I was in the service, I took correspondence courses. I took them for all the three years that I was in the service. And I had educated myself to the technical part of masonry and construction a lot. So I, uh, I and I had a lot of experience handling men when I was in the army. So I, I, I spent six months, uh, asked me to take care of a job. I said, I can take care of a job. 
I'm only an apprentice. So uh, I became a fledged bricklayer uh, foreman and uh, handling other men and stuff like that. So I got my uh, my journeyman's car and uh, uh, I started pushing work immediately. And uh, uh, I had the knack for it. And uh, in the Army service, how to handle men, how to handle people, uh, whether it be men or women, how to handle people. Uh, know your place. Know what you can do. Know what you can't do. Don't ever ask anybody what to, to do something that you can't do. Uh, that's handling. You know what I mean? So, uh, and one job led to another. Uh, one contractor led to another contractor. Uh, Soapy and I bought our home. Uh, we lived in it for 10 years, and then we built our new home, and uh, uh, we've been very happy with it, and I worked at my trade, building buildings all over, and then I went with Streeters as a mason, and uh, other mason foremen under me. I had those kind of things, uh, and it all started because I went into the Army how to handle men. Mm -hmm. The Army teaches you that, teaches you how to handle and teaches you responsibility. It teaches you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Yeah. The Army was not, I was glad to get out of it. I was happy that I was into it. I'd been a patriot my whole life. So, I about all that we've got, hon. Okay. All right. I have one other question for okay, you. Okay, you got, got another question. Okay. Thinking back on your experiences in the Army, is there anything that happened that you know about that you don't think is adequately reflected in history books today? I think you want people to know that. I don't know. There might be something in this. After the war was over, Marshal Tito uh, had done good things in protecting Yugoslavia and things like that. But he decided that he was a seaport. And the Allies said, no, you're not going to come down through there because he was an ally of, uh, of all the things that started uh, between uh, the Russians and the Slovakian people and all of those kind of things against the uh, Allies and stuff like that. So he was going to come down through the, the have a, a place at the Adria and uh, American Allies well, they almost came into a war there, and I was involved with flying supplies up there. In fact, I was supposed to get a medal for being in the uh, uh, in the theater of operation. Uh, oh, there's a medal for, uh, uh, but I never I never applied for it, never got it, and uh, but I was decorated. I was decorated in front of a whole group of people. i would be very proud to, you know, stand up there and a general of, uh, uh, a medal. I'm very proud of What that. was the medal? Uh, the Air Medal. Yeah, I had uh, qualified for that and they it had caught up to me when I got discharged. And I got it at home. It's in a nice, pretty uh, box and stuff like that. No, that's the only thing. We made, we made Tito back down. So he didn't come down through there. Now, it might be reflected in history books. I don't know, dear. But people I, just don't know about that. I, I, I have never looked it up. Okay. Uh, I've got a lot of, uh, you, you've caused me, I think I'll do a little research onto that and see if they did write about that, you know? Because we did make them back up. The, the, the uh, uh, British, uh, British uh, Eighth and the American Fifth swung over there. And, uh, and told them, no, you're not. And they needed a lot of supplies and in a hurry, and we flew them up. We flew round the clock, round the clock, round the clock, up and back, up and back, up and back. And uh, I remember that very, very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I was in the forces of occupation. That was the medal I was supposed to get, and I never, I never applied for it. And I, I just wanted to get out. When the, when the war was over, I wanted out. I, want, I had a wife, I wanted to come home, I wanted to start a family, I wanted to do the things because I wanted to be a bricklayer. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a builder. I wanted to build things. You're not, you know how one of the hardest things when I was a building superintendent later in years, I had to, I had to tear down buildings and I had to 
to burn buildings. Do you know how hard that is for someone to build them all his life? Yeah. Well, now how are, we, how are we doing now? Are we doing okay? This is great, Archie. Thank you so much for taking time to you talk know, that's, to me. You know, I'm glad that we, I'm glad we did this over again. Uh, of course, you knew what you were doing. And uh, uh, This concludes the interview for the Veterans History Project with Archie Kiefer. My name is Heather Wade, and I'm the archivist at the Shimon County Historical Society. I was the interviewer for this interview. And I love her. She's just, uh, I'm still in touch with her. Uh, you know, uh, there's another one I had. Her name was um, Alexis. Alexis. Anyway, she sent me an airmail or an email letter, and uh, uh, I kept putting it off. And she sent it to me in September. Mm -hmm. I kept putting off the answer because I wasn't ready to answer it mm -hmm. because she asked me something, and uh, I wasn't ready to. And so I tried to answer her. And uh, I, the mail come back. Hmm. 